Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Duncan, Dr. Terrence Duncan, and I'm with Carmel Brown. Um, we are going to provide our first webinar on LinkedIn. And so we wanted to expand off of previous platforms we've used to before to be able to share our knowledge at a higher level. And so the title of this particular webinar is Emotional Regulation Strategies to Achieve Work-Life Balance. I will provide the first several slides um, from an organizational perspective and from a research perspective. And then Ms. Carmel Brown will uh, go into deeper details in regards from a clinician therapeutical perspective perspective. Uh, you know, we would definitely welcome your, your comments in the chats, uh, either during the actual webinar or after the webinar. And uh, we have our contact information provided at the end of this particular webinar presentation. Good morning. Okay, so we are going to go over the material and just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Terrence Duncan. I'm the assistant professor at Liberty University and a doctoral instructor with uh, University of Phoenix. I'm also a management consultant that specializes in different areas of strategic management and leadership. I sit on several boards, including the Illinois Council of Business Enterprise Program for Minorities, the United Way, Age Smart, and Equity Legal Services. And I am an author of three books, uh, which are available on Amazon and which we will share at the end of this particular webinar. And I have over 15 years experience in healthcare, project management, human resources, strategic management, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Carmel, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carmel Brown. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Uh, I work in private practice full time with individuals, families. I also do a lot of work with corporations on workplace wellness. I presented multiple webinars and workshops and such for uh, so many corporations. I won't go into the names of the corporations, but probably well over 100. And I'm a board member of United Way and uh, the Small Business Development Center. And I work very closely with the Illinois Counseling Association. I am the Region 5 representative for the Governing Council for uh, the Illinois Counseling Association and a chapter president, uh, Lewis and Clark chapter here in Region 5. And I have more than 20 years of experience in the mental health and wellness field. Uh, in addition, I, uh, in addition to my practice, I have a group practice with my partner, Cecilia Carter, licensed professional counselor in Missouri. I'm an Illinois clinician. She's a Missouri clinician, and we are now uh, offering group therapy through our group practice, Wise Counsel. So, but we are still both maintaining our individual practice. So, uh, great to be here with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna talk about the learning objectives for this particular webinar. Uh, there's gonna be three of them. The first one, we are going to detail common causes for poor work-life balance. This is a hot topic, not only for entrepreneurs, but for small business owners, as well as larger organizations and employees who are working a traditional nine to five and trying to find ways to achieve a work-life balance. The second learning objective is to identify components of emotional regulation. And our final learning objective is to apply techniques to optimize work-life balance, uh, whether again, doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur, doesn't matter if you're working remotely, if you have a traditional nine to five where you're in the office, or if you're just the CEO of a large organization. Some of the common causes of poor work-life balance may include overutilization and long hours, financial worries and insecurities, lack of flexible work arrangements, and an organizational culture that encourages overworking. So um, for many of us who are working uh, on, <clears throat> excuse me, for many of us who are working remotely, you know, how often do you find yourself uh, not being able to pull away from your laptop, your iPad, or your mobile device, right? So for me being an online instructor, um, you know, where I teach 100% online, I have to ensure that I establish my own fair boundaries, not only just the way that I respond to my students, but also to potential clients or just people in general. So I do create hard boundaries as how I interact uh, with individuals just to make sure that uh, I am able to maintain my peace of mind as well as my sanity. Uh, uh, commuting, you know, for those who, uh, commute long distances, you know, the commute times have extended as people have changed their migration patterns. Uh, people are commuting longer to go from work to home and home to work. And then if you start adding in other stops to run errands, such as maybe doing, getting groceries, or if your children have sports activities, or, you know, any kind of after school activities, uh, that adds to your commute time. And just those are hours that are being taken away from you weekly, 
um, to be able to, you know, that you could be resting, that you could be uh, tended to home, um, or even just, you know, looking at a different project that you could do for your self-fulfillment. Wanted to provide some data on work-life balance just to underscore the scope and severity of the problem. Uh, approximately 60% of employees report a lack of boundaries. So that means that these employees feel like that the, the employer are intruding on their personal workspace and on their boundaries. So again, you know, we have so much accessibility through our mobile devices or through like such as our email, teams, um, you know, text messages or even phone calls. And so there's a lot of times where, um, you know, you look at how it was 20 years ago, once you were off the clock, you were off the clock. Now that off the clock, quote unquote, off the clock has extended a little bit more um, by having people, um, you know, reach out to you and ask you questions about your job or whatever the case may be, um, especially in healthcare. I think about people in healthcare. I came from a healthcare background. And I think about nurses, um, they may not necessarily be on call for that particular day, but then they wind up receiving a lot of on call or text messages about scheduling and things like that. And they're not being compensated for. Um, and, you know, when you're telling them like, hey, I'm not the on call uh, personnel or, you know, the manager on duty, uh, people are still calling and asking. And that's where you have those lines starting to get blurred away. 72% of employees reported having positive work-life balance as a priority. So for myself personally, for those who know me personally, um, one thing that I always say is like, I love taking naps and I'm a napper and I'm a person that actually tries to schedule naps and very disappointed and sad if I do not achieve my naps on a regular basis. So I don't have to take a nap every day, but I do like to take a nap two to three times a day, but that is my way of recharging. That's just a way for me to reset. Uh, some people may say that meditation or yoga or, or even exercising is a good way for them just to kind of really help boost their, boost their self-esteem and to maintain work-life balance. 43% of remote employees work more than 40 hours versus traditional employees. And so, um, again, um, I've actually worked either remotely or independently for over 15 years. And I can tell you that uh, my work habits and, again, my boundaries that I've created has changed um, at year 15 through 20 compared to the first 15 years because I was always engaged. I felt like because I had a computer or a laptop or, or iPad available, I felt like I had to respond to every message, every email immediately. And, um, and you, you add that up over time, the interactions and stuff, you know, often you do go over 40 hours and then eventually you kind of open up the laptop, right? And then you start getting into the emails or you have to look something up and then you start getting locked in into something. Something to kind of keep in mind is that it takes about five minutes to get your mind fully engaged into a particular activity so if you like doing crossword puzzles uh you know you get into five minutes all of a sudden you're deep into a crossword puzzle uh if you are working on a project or even like uh i teach like um dissertations and whatnot, you know, I tell my students and uh, candidates that if you are working on your dissertation, give yourself five to 10 minutes because you are engaged. The same thing applies here for remote employees, uh, because once you really start getting locked into something, um, it's really difficult for you to separate. And then that time continues to increase. And the final data point in regards to work-life balance is that 23% of businesses believe that they promote positive work-life balance, which really underscores how many businesses do not. So just imagine that this is not a, um, a academic survey, but this is actually just taken from a, a company that specializes on the data on figuring out what's going on with some of these organizations. And just imagine that, you know, about 70% of businesses don't make that as a priority. And, uh, you know, you, you hear that more employees want to have positive work-life balance, but you see that a lot of organizations are not providing that as an added benefit. So there are benefits of positive work-life balance and they include um, your increased productivity. So the more relaxed and recharged that you are, uh, the more that you're able to create that separation, as you will, um, you become more productive, you become more engaged, your mind is more refreshed and you're able to attend uh, whatever task that you need to attend to. Uh, you also have feelings of value for personal and family obligations. And so for myself, um, I put a lot of value in my relationships, not, not only with my family, but also with my friends and with others and stuff. So um, you know, because of 
this separation of work-life balance, I do tend to try to reach out to see if somebody is doing better, if they're feeling sick, uh, or if somebody lost a loved one, just being able to separate that time to spend time with that person who have lost a loved one and things of that nature, or even just simple something as simple as hanging out after hours, um, you know, after traditional hours, that really makes a big difference uh, for me as well. It keeps me re-energized and keeps me re-engaged to do whatever task I have to do for the next day or even later on that evening. Uh, another positive benefit of a uh, work-life balance and maintaining work-life balance is to improve your mental health as well as your overall well-being. And so you feel, again, you feel fresher, you feel a little bit more, um, you know, locked in and sorts. You don't feel like that you're stressed as much. Things flow a little bit, a little bit easier um, throughout your day. And, and I, was, I spoke about this before in a previous podcast is about flow and flow is very important. Um, it's like more of a groove of sorts, you know, what is your groove uh, as you are maintaining your work-life balance? balance, as well as improved engagement. And so because you're not mentally stressed or fatigued, uh, your engagement winds up being a little bit more productive. So it kind of slides back into the productivity. And so, for example, this week, I have a lot of engagement uh, going on at different hours. But because I'm able to create those pockets of uh, peace, I'm able to engage those different, um, you know, obligations with the same level of intensity and energy as I would at the very first uh, opportunity for me to do something such as this particular project for today. It's very important for us to avoid low self-regulation, and Carmel is going to get into that a little bit more deeply uh, later on in this webinar. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight some key points, which includes um, people pleasing behavior. Um, you know, so when we are trying to be a people pleaser, it actually lowers our self-regulation. It puts others people, puts other people ahead of us um, more frequently and then putting ourselves as a priority. Uh, we become more impulsive when we have more outbursts. Uh, because of the low self-regulations, uh, we're a little bit more triggered. We're more, more quicker uh, to um, be upset about certain things and just not able to let certain uh, events or outcomes go. Our procrastination increases and is easily distracted. Uh, we become more easily distracted. And I just actually uh, provided a post in one of my Facebook groups, professional Facebook groups, about the importance of avoiding procrastination, um, you know, and being easily distracted because that creates self-sabotage. And so if you say that you are working on this particular project or you're going to do something and you continue to let other and you have low self-regulation, uh, you continue to let other events and, you know, interfere with your progress. And then you continue to push these projects out uh, to the point that you either don't do it no more, or maybe you don't have the same energy in trying to address uh, whatever task that you need to complete a particular project. You, you know, having low self-regulation also could be seen as um, a sign of weakness or uh, arrogance, meaning that you know, your self-reflection of yourself could, you know, you start beating yourself up a little bit more, your, your self-esteem and your confidence gets a little bit lower, or you feel like that you have to mask certain aspects of your personality and your behavior by being more arrogant. So there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And often when we become arrogant, we, uh, we tend to uh, try to gloss over some of our deficiencies uh, just to kind of almost overcompensate of sorts. So um, there is a distinct difference between arrogance and confidence and misreading social cues and dynamics. And so just think about being whether it doesn't matter if it's virtual, it doesn't matter if you are in person, it could actually even be an email community communication. If you have low self-regulation and you go back to being impulsive, um, you can really uh, misconstrue a text message or an email that you had from a client or a potential client or even just a, a stakeholder and uh, you take it the wrong way and then it just kind of spirals out of control, which could be an unavoidable event uh, had you had a decent work-life balance as well as self-regulation. So my final point for this particular webinar is that we need to recognize the five components of self-regulation, uh, which includes self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, motivation, and social skills. And so really it comes down to how do you manage your emotions? Even though that we have to have a business-like mentality when we deal with our clients or if we're networking or if we're just out in the community uh, or even trying to land a new deal, uh, we have to understand how to regulate our emotions. If we let our emotions get out of control, then it creates this off balance persona of sorts, and it creates a uh, potential for conflict. And some of the conflict that we wind up getting into winds up being unnecessary. And then so if you actually 
If you are listening to this webinar live, or if you're looking at this at a later date, just ask yourself, how many times have you let your emotions or you let your, your pride, so to say, uh, prevent you from having an opportunity? You know, are you so rigid in your foundations and your principles um, and that you're so uh, strong willed against it that you, you know, how much money have you left on the table as an entrepreneur or how many uh, clients have you turned away um, because of low self-regulation? And so these are the things that uh, I wanted to speak about in this particular topic and um, I'm going to turn it over to Carmel. That's all great stuff, Dr. Duncan. Thank you for that. I'm really glad that we're discussing this topic today because uh, emotions, they're really a, a very central feature of the workplace, uh, the entire workplace experience. And of course, at home as well. And so uh, this coupled with work-life balance, I think is really important. And when you think about the workplace and just leadership roles in general, and I'm referring to supervisors, managers, community leaders, and such, uh, the tasks and uh, the interpersonal demands that leadership typically faces, uh, especially in the workplace, are really emotionally charged uh, by context, mostly. And so leaders have to be intentional about modifying their emotions whenever it's necessary and being able to have influence over their emotions, what they're feeling, how they're experiencing their emotions, how they are expressing their emotions as well. And so having that positive influence on your team is, is it's critical. Emotional regulation is um, in order to have that that uh, influence over your team. And so uh, leaders are also dealing with a, a variety of ethical dilemmas on the job, which require emotional regulation, a high degree or high level of emotional regulation. And uh, interpersonal conflicts, they occur at home and on the job. And so any type of organizational crisis and all those things require uh, emotional regulation. So I think it's really important that this topic continues. and. Uh, now, I want to go over these slides, benefits of high degree of emotional regulation, higher levels of happiness and well-being. Of course, when you're happy, when you feel well, you're going to be more likely to perform well. You're going to be more focused and tuned in on the job and at home as well. And uh, more financial resources and disposable income. Uh, research does show that this is a benefit of being able to regulate uh, and then reduced risk for burnout. Burnout has severe um, downfalls, obviously, for uh, the workplace. And when you are experiencing burnout, you're typically just not uh, tuned in. You're not doing well. You're not uh, checking those boxes and getting those things off of your task list. So. so some risk factors for poor emotional regulation. Well, a lot of people don't know that they have some risk factors that are critical in, in knowing, and one being history of trauma. If there's a history of trauma, you have to be aware that that impacts your brain. Trauma changes the brain, and it impacts the amygdala in the brain. And so being able to self-regulate uh, is hindered most often with trauma. So it's important to know if that has been your history, that you may need to get a little bit of assistance in learning some self-regulation skills. Mental illness, if you have been diagnosed with a mental illness or some disorder uh, of the brain, it is critical that you understand that this is a risk factor for uh, having uh, inability to, to self-regulate. And then genetic predisposition, and that really goes back to mental illness as well, because uh, that's mental illness has a genetic uh, predisposition for most people. And so it's important to know that that history is there, that genetically you may experience some, some challenges in this area. And then ACEs, those adverse childhood experiences. And that really connects to trauma, of course. Uh, and that could be a variety of things. Uh, trauma or, or ACEs could be, of course, uh, neglect, abuse, uh, exposure to violence and things like that, growing up with a parent who has a severe mental illness or parents that abuse substances, uh, all of those things. And, and the thing about trauma 
and adverse childhood experiences, it doesn't have to be some form of abuse or violence. It could be a lot of small things that kind of build up over time. For example, having parents that were not emotionally available as a child, that could result in a traumatic experience, not having that emotional availability or having parents that work a lot. They're not physically or emotionally available very often. And uh, and that goes back to something you were talking about earlier, Dr. Duncan, just simply about uh, the financial difficulties. A lot of families experience that. And very often parents have to work two jobs and sometimes they're not sleeping very much because of all the other responsibilities in addition to those two jobs that they have at home. And of course, those extended work schedules that we tend to uh, face or experience in today's society. And then stress. Stress certainly impacts the ability to regulate or not. And so it's important to uh, find yourself looking for stress management techniques or getting with a clinician or someone that could help with being able to acquire some, some skills to use in your personal and professional life to regulate stress or manage stress so that it does not impede self-regulation. And then TBI, traumatic brain injury, uh, that is uh, something that's going to impact the regions of the brain that allow or promote self-regulation. And so some signs, signs of dysregulation uh, and some of the emotional responses that are poorly regulated by the brain, trying to per per achieve perfection. Uh, that is something that is an indicator that a person might be dealing with dysregulation and uh, maybe struggling to, to self-regulate. Angry outbursts uh, at home or at work, that is certainly a sign of uh, inability to self-regulate. Substance abuse, that's certainly a sign. A lot of people tend to try to numb because they feel out of control internally and abusing substances sometimes makes them feel as though there is some balance there or you know it's forced uh it's numbing and so but but truthfully after those substances are abused long uh, term they tend to cause more problems uh, than you initially had with regulation because those substances impact the brain long term and then uh, just relentlessly seeking revenge uh, just uh, we've seen that in movies often in, in, you know, just a depiction of that someone that's just not giving up. Someone has offended them. Someone has caused some type of hurt or harm or pain. And a person is just not able to let it go. They're not able to move on. They're focused on it. And it could be catastrophic in many ways. And intense mood swings. Obviously, uh, this is something that will require uh, clinical attention, uh, an assessment, possibly diagnosis, and maybe even medication. And uh, so those are certainly uh, serious and can cause a lot of harm. And suicidal ideation, obviously, that is a an indicator that a person is struggling to self-regulate. And once again, these are mostly things that require clinical attention. And some of the dangers, uh, I've mentioned a couple here already, but engaging in behavior that later results in shame or legal problems. I talked about that relentlessly uh, seeking uh, revenge and things like that, that could result in harming oneself or other people. And creating conflict or strain in interpersonal relationships is, is something that happens very often with uh, dysregulation. Self-harm or injury to self, and deterioration in influence or just uh, being a, a positive, having a positive impact on other people, all of those things can certainly be uh, severely impacted when a person is not able to regulate. And then uh, Dr. Duncan talked a little bit earlier just about ruining those professional opportunities. And, and I always say you have to deal with yourself first. And if you're going to be in a leadership role, you're going to run a business uh, or whatever you have going on professionally or personally, it's really important that you understand that your ability to regulate yourself at your emotional experience is critical in success in any area of life.
So knowing your personal triggers, that is critical. I think that it's sometimes uh, underestimated uh, the extent to which knowing what your personal buttons are and the extent to which that's important in our overall success in life, in our interpersonal relationships and our careers, and just our ability to have a good quality of life. So when it comes to personal triggers, I'll give an example. If you know that when other people raise their voice at you, it reminds you of a caregiver, maybe a abusive, emotionally abusive parent growing up. If you know that other people raising their voice at you reminds you of that particular person, it's important to be aware of that so that when you're on the job and maybe you have an employee that doesn't know how to self-regulate, maybe they're dysregulated and they're uh, expressing their emotional experience uh, with you and to you, it can feel overwhelming for you. And you have to be atten pay attention to your thoughts about that, uh, meaning maybe that's triggered some thoughts that this person is maybe being aggressive towards me. Uh, and then there's some feelings that are going to come with that. And, and then maybe some even uh, behavioral responses. So it's important to know that a person raising their voice is a trigger for me. And I need to be aware of that and becoming familiar with those autopilot emotional and behavioral responses. I know that on autopilot, my emotional response to someone raising their voice is going to make me think that I need to protect myself. And when I'm thinking that I need to protect myself, my feelings are going to be consistent with maybe I'm not trusting this person or uh, that uh, maybe I just don't feel safe with that particular person or in that setting. And then the behavioral responses might be that you start to emotionally or physically distance yourself from that person. So it's important to know what your autopilot responses are when those triggers occur so that you don't become dysregulated or you reduce the, the likelihood that you do. And if you do, you're able to manage that a little better than you would if you were not aware. And I've mentioned risk factors. It's important to know what your personal risk factors are. And then the last thing I want to say on this slide is regulation over repression. Uh, sometimes people want to repress whatever it is that they're thinking. We don't always have control over what we think. Most often we don't. And uh, so what we're thinking is typically what's powering or perpetuating what we're feeling. And sometimes those feelings can be uh, emotionally overwhelming. And let's be honest, emotional regulation is a challenge for everyone at times. You know, that's, that's human. But sometimes people think that they can repress those emotions and those thoughts. And sometimes that makes things worse. They make it, it makes it much harder. Uh, and, and when you, if you close your eyes for 15 minutes, and you focus on any particular thought. Say you're thinking about your favorite superhero for 15 seconds. And after you open your eyes and you try not to think about that superhero for, for let's just say the next 30 minutes, it's gonna be challenging for you to not think about that superhero or whatever the thing was that you were thinking about for those that you focused on for those 15 seconds. And so trying to repress the thoughts of that person or that thing for those next few minutes afterwards is gonna be a challenge. So rather than trying to repress it, learn how to regulate. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those skills or techniques that you might be able to use to do that. So speaking of which, DBT here, dialectical behavioral therapy, I won't go too much into this, but it, it simply comes down to distress tolerance. Uh, DBT is a therapeutic or clinical approach that we use very often in therapy. Uh, it's been around for quite some time and it's very effective. And uh, a lot of people uh, actually specifically seek out a DBT therapist. Um, I personally have been trained in DBT and uh, it, it's very much focused on mindfulness and uh, interpersonal effectiveness. And uh, once again, it's dealing with overwhelming pain. And, and like I said earlier, overwhelming pain and distressing thoughts happens to everyone. And once again, we all have some control over how we experience those emotions. Radical acceptance is one of the most common uh, factors in DBT. And that really comes down to changing your mindset and also your behavior, your attitude. And so acknowledging your specific experience with your emotions 
uh, without judging or criticizing. And that's the hard part with D DBT, acknowledging your current circumstances, your current emotional experience, being aware of it, being present in it, and not judging or criticizing that. So, and saying things that are kind of self-affirming in those moments, such as, I can't change the past or I can't go back and change what has occurred, but I can control what's happening now. I do have some control over my current circumstances. So what am I going to do now in order to prevent uh, dysregulation or further dysregulation? So being able to distract yourself from whatever thoughts you might have that are distressing in that moment is going to be very important. Uh, being able to distract yourself from not only your thoughts, but any self-destructive behavior that you might be at risk for engaging in. Substance abuse is a self-destructing behavior. Uh, it, it's something that some people do to try to regulate. But if you are able to find some healthier ways or healthier interven intervention skills and techniques to distract yourself from whatever those distressing thoughts are, you're going to be less likely to engage in that self-destructing behavior. Um, something that's very basic is imagining yourself in a place that you really enjoy. I personally like the mountains. Uh, some people like the beach, but just taking a few moments just to imagine and envision yourself being somewhere else. Or you can physically leave. That is also a distraction that uh, you can use. Remove yourself from whatever that situation is that um, you might be in. And there are so many different distraction techniques that you can use. And I won't go into all of them for time's sake. Uh, there's, uh, you can use every all of your five senses for distraction. You can use smells like essential oils. You can use your favorite foods and such. You can use... Uh, your sense of touch by keeping something soft and velvety in your in your car or in your desk at work. And so it's really important that we remember that the human brain is a wonderful thought provoking machine and it's always working. It's always thinking. And so we have to have a plan for ourselves in order to be able to combat some of those thoughts that might be uh, harmful for our overall productivity and quality of life. All right. And so I don't want to go too far into uh, DBT skills because I could go on and on for an hour with that. So I won't do that. So we're going to move on. Cognitive behavioral therapy is also a approach that we use in therapy for distressing thoughts or for emotional regulation. And the thing about CBT and DBT, CBT is more used to help to identify what's going on, whereas DBT is more geared towards helping to find things to do about it, how to address it, what interventions are going to be necessary. So CBT helps you to identify some of the triggers that you might have that might be harmful. I mentioned a, a very uh, minor, a very uh, a basic concept or example here a few minutes ago, uh, but CBT helps to identify triggers any dysfunctional or unhealthy or negative thought patterns that you might tend to have that are kind of habitual or repetitive for you that might be harmful or maybe perpetuating emotional distress. And then what feelings or distressing feelings that you're having as a result of those thoughts. And then your dysfunctional behavioral patterns that come with those thoughts and feelings. So with CBT, your therapist can help you to identify any of those patterns. And you can do some of that on your own. There's plenty of CBT and DBT activities out there uh, that you can do at home or at work uh, by yourself. Well, you probably don't want to do those at work. So if you learn how to improve your quality of life by being aware of your triggers, your dysfunctional thought patterns, your autopilot feelings and emotions and any behavioral responses that you tend to have that are dysfunctional and habitual. Lifestyle. Lifestyle is critical in emotional regulation. We often underestimate the extent to which our way of living impacts how we feel. Proper nutrition, and when I say proper nutrition, I'm referring to macronutrients and micronutrients. Uh, our macronutrients, those are our proteins, our fats, and our carbohydrates. Those things are critical in brain function. Most often, we're learning how to eat for our physical health and physical well-being, and we are omitting the importance of 
how we eat impacts brain health as well. So we always hear about a heart healthy diet. I'm here to tell you there's a such thing as a brain healthy diet. I won't go into all those specifics, but there's so much to learn in that area in our society and micronutrients. Those are your vitamins and minerals. Uh, there are so many supplements, so many vitamins out there that are really good for brain health, that are good for cognition and functioning and mood regulation that are very natural. Of course, some people are on prescription medication. Psychotropic medication is very important. Uh, and so if your doctor is prescribing that, you certainly want to ensure that you are following your doctor's orders with any prescription that they have prescribed for you first and foremost over anything. But talking to your primary care physician and your prescriber about adding some lifestyle changes, um, I don't recommend adding any nutrients or uh, micronutrients, vitamins or supplements to your regimen without speaking with your physician or your prescriber. Getting an adequate amount of sleep. Sleep hygiene is critical for brain health and ability to self-regulate. If you have looked at any studies about uh, how a person interacts with other people, how they're able to perform on the job, and just their overall quality of life when they're habitually lacking sleep, it is profound. So that is critical physical activity. Most often we're learning from people that physical activity is important for our physical health, for losing weight and such is just as critical for our mental health. So exercise and eating and sleeping for brain health, for a healthier quality of life and improved emotional regulation. And then there are some threats that I'm going to refer to here real quick to emotional regulation, remote work. Uh, and the reason I say remote work is a threat is because a lot of people are sedentary. They're sitting down a lot um, at their desk uh, whenever they're working from home and they tend to isolate as well. You're more removed. Whereas when we went to the office, we were connected with other people more. So be aware. And then uh, children are caring for family members. So being a caregiver can sometimes be uh, something that contributes to poor frustration control. Uh, and then social media can be a threat to emotional regulation as well. Politics, financial distress as well. All right. Thank you, Carmel, um, for your, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, for your breakdown and from your clinical insight, I think that's very important. I think that, you know, as we continue to do these webinars, it's very important to have a dual perspective. So um, we don't want to just provide just the, the overview. We want to kind of really deep dive into uh, some of the challenges that exist for some of the problems identified that we'll speak about and then come up with possible solutions. And we can go on and on and on and on um, until the day is long. But you know, we want to condense these two you know, within an hour and then also provide an opportunity to answer any questions in the chat uh, or for those who are actually participating live or even have people who want to ask questions during the webinar as well. I uh, would we definitely would appreciate that. And before we go into the ending, I wanted to be able to talk about a scenario um, that Carmen and I have worked on just to you know, really provide insight into this entire webinar. And the scenario is that there is a father who is married, a one kid that's in preschool who requires a lot of attention, one in elementary school playing sports, and a third in middle school having difficulty um, as, as far as social settings are concerned. Both parents work long hours in corporate America. The father travels. Uh, the mom does not, but is responsible for leading meetings weekly, uh, her supervisory duties, in addition to a workload. When the father is gone, um, they spend a couple of days a week preparing the family for one parent on duty um, for approximately five to seven days. The mom has experienced burnout on a few occasions uh, due to her workload and states that she often feels alone and often feels like a single parent. The father often returns, um, but he feels lonely and neglected uh, when he gets home and he's looking and leaning to his family. So you have that disconnect factor going on right there. His wife is worn out, disconnected, exhausted, and in need of a break. She does not want to learn it, lean in. She wants to unplug and disconnect for her recovery. She wants to, uh, um, this has resulted in uh, relationship problems, marital problems at home, as well as an inability to regulate emotions at home, performance issues at work, and both parents are feeling inadequate. 
And so if you are hearing this story and it doesn't, um, you know, it's not just for people who are married, but, you know, I know that there's also single parents who may feel, you know, overlooked or feel like they're overwhelmed, underappreciated and whatnot due to their responsibilities. Uh, we do have some suggestions um, that can really help uh, manage. And uh, one of them is communication um, and ensuring that you're able to have a conversation on a regular basis uh, for those who are in a marital or cohabitant relationship. I think that's very important. Um, you know, also, I would say just from my perspective, you know, if you're a single parent and you have those responsibilities, make sure that you schedule time out for yourself. Um, you know, it, it's really amazing when, and it, I say that because I also teach financial literacy. Um, and one of the things I tell people is like, you'll be really amazed if you sit still and find out what you can actually carve out um, to make a big difference. And so if you eat out all the time, and you're complaining that you're broke and you don't have that much money to do X, Y, Z. If you cut down going out or eating for lunch or dinner uh, a couple of times a week, you know, all of a sudden you save yourself hundreds of dollars. Uh, same thing, even as, uh, you know, setting time out from you know pulling away from social media pulling away from the netflix and the tv or whatever the case may be if you really need to decompress you really do have time to decompress away from electronics away from other thoughts um carmel had talked about mindfulness and and lifestyle adjustments that you need to make um that that you should make as far as establishing work-life balance that's very important as well uh carmel what say you about some of the recommendations for emotional regulation um, for emotional regulation, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to mention adequate rest is going to be critical for someone in that situation because most often, uh, I know I have a lot of clients with very similar scenarios, and that lack of rest is like an added piece to the chaos that they tend to try to manage and juggle throughout their day. And then uh, you mentioned uh, self-care. Take You said care, take uh, time for yourself. Self-care is really important, and we, we definitely underestimate the impact that self-care can have on our overall emotional well-being and quality of life. And what feels like self-care for one person may not feel like self-care for someone else. So it's important that you try a few different things and find out what feels good for you. Uh, meditation and mindfulness is certainly very helpful. And uh, there are so many different techniques, and I strongly encourage people to uh, get online and search for some uh, mindfulness activities that they can engage in. There's so many out there. There's videos on YouTube and such. Uh, you don't have to see a therapist to learn mindfulness. And then something else that I would recommend is talking to your primary care physician. I'm always going to recommend that because your, your doctor needs to know what's going on. If there's any changes with your uh, mental or physical status, um, and then uh, introduce um, some of those uh, distress, tolerance, distress tolerance uh, skills that I talked about, uh, some of those DBT skills. And I could go on for hours about uh, DBT, distress tolerance skills, but it's important that you look those up or get with a therapist that can help you to adopt some of those. Uh, and then um, work-life balance, uh, Dr. Duncan, uh, I think uh, scheduling every minute of the day uh, for some people with this scenario going on, especially for that week, that distressing week is going to be important. And what I mean by that is before you know it, you can find yourself working the entire day and not taking that time out. And so if you know that you have a nap scheduled from one to one thirty or from one to two o'clock, you know that you need to stop working no matter what's going on around that time to take that nap, take that time out for yourself. And even scheduling time to eat is really important. So you can miss out on important things like sleep and, and nutrition and spend more time working. And, and that's something that you certainly don't want to do. Uh, and then the other thing with your schedule is uh, social media. I mentioned that earlier. A lot of people are spending way more time mindlessly scrolling through social media and that's causing a reduction in productivity, not to mention that can also have an impact on your ability to self-regulate. So um, those are some of the things that I would recommend for work-life balance. Uh, and just to chime in on that, there are, um, you know, several studies that are really showing the negative effects of social media. Um, you know, for those who have prolonged use. And there's nothing wrong with social media per se, um, because obviously this is going to be on LinkedIn, YouTube, and whatnot. But um, it, it's, it's the frequency and the length of how you're engaged in social media, because it doesn't matter how, mental re how mentally resilient you are or just how much in control you are in your life. When you are subjected to, you know, um, 
you know, hundreds of images and videos and, and, and content, especially when you have a system, you talk, talk about AI, uh, you, talk, you know, you also think about algorithms and how the algorithms are forcing this narrative on you. It, it does a lot of different things. You know, one of the research studies says that could be that it influences your buying behavior. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of these marketers and advertisers, they're, you know, they're getting the data from the social media companies and they're, you know, and over time your defenses are going down. And so you are more prone to make impulsive po p purchases, right? So even if you see the images and even if you're not clicking into that ad, uh, that image is still in your mind based on the analytics and the algorithms. And then it's influencing to, to, uh, to engage in negative behavior, uh, you know, we talk about financial distress, you know, sometimes your social media habit could lead into uh, financial distress. You know, mindfulness, uh, Carmel uh, had uh, made a great point about not, you know, you don't have to see a therapist and there are ways to be mindful, uh, you know, uh, taking walks. Uh, if you know if the weather is permitting it's very helpful and you don't have to wait for the spring or summer you know you can also do walks when it's a little bit cool not too cold but you know if you have to wear a light jacket uh, you know after five ten minutes you know your body's going to start warming up and whatnot and uh, it's good for uh, blood flow you know we talk about being sedentary a lot of us are very sedentary now especially uh, regardless if you know of your job title or position and um, you know we are sitting at home a little bit more and it's good just to get the blood flowing it's actually good for uh, uh, your mental well-being you know studies also show that you know just walking regularly 30 minutes four to five times a day can actually decrease the risk of dementia and alzheimer's um it also has uh, cardiovascular benefits as well so you know i find myself to be an avid walker um for those who uh, may feel like well how can i schedule time you know look at it from you know one thing i like to do is like to read and, and try to understand what some of the more successful uh, wealthier people who are of positive benefit uh, are doing. And that is a priority to them. They're not on social media much. Uh, they schedule their time to relax. They schedule their time to eat. They schedule every, every minute counts. And, and what it does, it creates efficiencies. And so you have to also keep in mind too, that for what we pour into work, we pour more into what our job is or into our business, uh, to our consultancy or to our community outreach than we do to ourselves. And so it's really amazing and stuff how we focus on uh, efficiency for organization but just the lack of attention to detail provide efficiency to ourselves and we have to make that as a priority so uh, we don't want to go over an hour we're getting close to them part mark um, I actually showed Carmel's books her books are available on Amazon um, I've read your exhilarating life I love it uh, I've looked read it twice it's still in my living room so if I ever get into a rut you know outside of reaching out to Carmel uh, I do uh, pull some nuggets out of there um, just to kind of get myself recentered and reflected and let's be honest you know Carmel and I were both human beings you know so we are experts on these particular topics but we do have have to um, you know sometimes we have to coach each other up and sometimes we do have these long phone calls where we're just trying to to see the field differently just to kind of get another perspective and uh, you know reading if you're not a big big book, book reader uh, listen to a podcast audio book uh, there's always like small you know, one two minute article reads to check out but um, you know but Carmel's books they're very helpful um, for your mental your emotional and your physical um, as well as your nutrition the books that I have, the the leadership one is basically on leadership. I use that a lot for trainings and workshops and uh, consulting. The Mahogany Legacy Project that does involve uh, Black social economic issues and the four fits of holistic growth is in a similar vein uh, with Carmel's books where it focuses on uh, your personal development, uh, you know, seeing the field a little bit differently and attending to your emotions and your mental as well as your physical. We want to say thank you for your participation. We would love to, uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, but I'm going to look at it in a second. Um, our next webinar, which will be in July, we'll have a webinar where we're going to look at the difference between emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. A lot of people really get those two topics mixed up. There is some cross-functionality and um, you know cross understanding between both of them but there are distinct differences so um, we wanted to make sure that we address our our emotional regulation internally first before we start applying it into interacting with others uh, with an emotional intelligence standpoint
And so don't have any questions in the chat uh, for those in the audience. Are there any questions that you may uh, want to ask uh, as about the scenarios you would like for us to address? Or uh, would you like to kind of give a personal example, um, maybe for, uh, you know, maybe a suggestion that, you know, what you do that somebody could really benefit from um, in regards to this topic? Yes. Good morning, um, Dr. Good morning. Duncan, Carmel. Good morning. Um, I don't have any questions or anything I'd like to share at this time, but I do want to thank you both for your time um, and just let you know that uh, this has been very helpful and actually very insightful. Some of the things that you're presenting on, you would think that, um, you know, people would practice these things, people, you know, including myself, right? You would think that these things are, um, you know, habit, but they're not, you know, and they need to be addressed um, because sometimes it's, you have to make it plain, right? Some of the um, the healthy eating styles that you discussed, Carmel, um, some of the self-regulation that uh, Dr. Duncan, you talked about, um, you know, when we're going through our day-to-day -day functions, we don't really recognize that we're doing these things or that we're neglecting some of these items. Um, so it's important to have continuous education, in my opinion, about um, these topics. So I thank you for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Alicia. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Thanks for joining. Hi, I also just wanted to jump in real quick. And uh, one of the things that Carmel mentioned was about leaders who focus on the development, but then they uh, don't often take time to focus on um, paying attention to themselves and identifying opportunities for themselves to um, re rejuvenate themselves. And so that's one of the things that I've started to talk about too. And when people are developing their goals for the year or just personal goals for self-development, make sure you also set once a month, if you can, at least figure out a way that you're going to reward yourself. How are you going to take a walk? How are you going to um, just do something that you enjoy or to take a break from something that's causing you stress? or identify what's causing you stress and still be able to focus on your goals. So I think that was a very important point and I appreciated the context around that part of the conversation. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for joining in. Yeah, and just to add to that, it makes me think about something my sister says and she's a, um, a therapist, but she works more with children and um, you know, incentivizing. My sister told me I need to always incentivize uh, something like a tangible goalpost. And um, I don't know, we didn't talk about it on the work-life balance, but, you know, you did make me think about it, Pam, that, you know, you know, let's create something for us to work for. You know, we should always find something to strive for. I was in Costa Rica uh, a couple of years ago for vacation. And um, I, I remember on a tour, something that really stood out to me, Costa Rica has some of the, uh, the oldest living populations in the world. And so a, uh, a, a I think it was a gerontologist or whoever. Anyways, the researcher had interviewed uh, the, the people that lived in Costa Rica, and they said, "Well, what is the you know what is your secret?" And they say that you have something to live for every day, you know, even the elderly. Um, you know, they they tend to their own uh, gardens, they tend to their own livestock, they're cooking. The family is very communal, um, so that means that there is a lot of there is no social isolation, um, there's no loneliness, you know, because they're all in it together. And I think that as we live in a capitalized American culture, um, you know, we're almost wired to uh, to continue to go, 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 and then wait to the end of our lives um, to be able to say, oh, well, let me enjoy this, or we're waiting to go on vacation um, to be able to enjoy. But then, you know, it's like you only have so many weeks provided to you for vacation, so you're basically basically resigning yourself for 49 weeks, right? Where you're always working or you have to feel like you have to call off sick or we have to say, well, I'm taking a quote unquote mental health day. Um, create those symptoms, you know, on a monthly basis or at least, you know, bi-monthly, you know, something where you can look forward to. You don't necessarily have to go out of town. It could be, excuse me, I got the hiccups. Um, but you can, you know, do something like go to a, a live show somewhere that's free. Uh, you know, go to the park and, um, and just, you know, just, no phones and just take it all in or just have a nice casual conversation with somebody at the park. You know, um, it could be a stranger or somebody that, you know, uh, meet somebody for breakfast, you know, just taking that time out. Carmel and I, uh, we connect every now and then uh, for breakfast. I know Elijah and I, we have connected a couple of times for breakfast before. Um, and, you know, that really means a lot because it's not always about the business. Um, you know, it's, it's just about tender to ourselves and just our emotional needs, even, even if we're not aware of it. So, uh, thank you for that. And, and like I said, continue to create incentives. 
and uh, don't see anything else on the chat. And we are actually under an hour. Yay, us. And uh, I definitely appreciate for those who are attended this particular webinar and for those who are listening to us later. Uh, like I said, in July, uh, I think the third week or the second or third week of July, I don't have the date offhand. We will talk about the difference between emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. And we'll continue to provide topics where we are looking at it from a business and from a clinical standpoint, because they're actually married one and the same. Um, you know, even though we're uh, two different quote unquote disciplines, we're still focused on the same um, element, which is you to people. So thank you everybody for participating and uh, y'all have a blessed rest of the week. Goodbye. Goodbye.